All right, uh, let's get started. Thank you, everybody, uh, for showing up at 9 o'clock uh, on Thursday morning. Um, I very much appreciate it. It's great to see you here. Um, uh, weather's a little better, so hopefully today uh, is more fun for everyone. Um, I guess we've already jumped ahead to our extended version of the title of this talk. Um, we just stuck with what's new in notifications in Android and, oh, OK. I see what it is. I'm just resting my thumb on the advancer, and so that's the problem. Um, <laughs> we definitely rehearsed this. I swear, I promise to everybody. Um, I'll bump back here for a little bit and just talk, say that we're going to talk about notifications today, but we're going to spend about half our time talking about Android Wear 2.0, because that got a great big uh, reveal yesterday at the keynote. Um, and. Uh, I thought the comedy session was this evening, not, not right now. All right, well, we'll, we'll deal with it. Um, my name is Dan Sandler. Uh, I'm the lead engineer on the Android System UI team, which is all the stuff you can see on the screen that's not any other app. Uh, and I'm Alex Hills. I am an engineer on the Wear System UI team, which has the exact same description. <laughs> but smaller and attached Still to your body. Advancing some, too. Still advancing. Oh, man, this thing is this, it's, it's on its own. All right, we're just going to keep moving. Um, so we've made some changes in Android uh, notifications uh, this year. Uh, we make some changes every year. This is kind of a big change this year because we've um, messed with the templates. I mean, you see here we've actually messed with the templates many times in the past. Um, this is probably our first big. I'm just going to set this down. I'm just going to set that thing down. We'll advance maybe by hitting the arrow buttons. Um, in N, we've changed it again. But the reason we've changed it is to bring things more in line with material design and to make things a little more scannable. Um, generally, uh, we've got a room for a little more text. Uh, you have uh, the ability to, OK, I actually do need to do the builds now. <laughs> um, all right, here we go. OK, fantastic. OK, so we've, made, we've cleaned things up. Um, they're a little less busy. Uh, we've hit our material key lines now instead of winging it like we did before. Um, you now see that we can uh, tell you exactly which app posted each notification. That's accountability for you, the end user, which we never really had before unless you knew to long press in the notification. So that's good. Um, and we've taken the icons out of actions, mostly so that you've got more room uh, for those long labels. Uh, that might show up in some translations. And then finally, my personal pet peeve about notifications, since we introduced expandable notifications in Jelly Bean, um, is that you can now tell what's expandable. Uh, there's an expansion widget, a little uh, chevron that appears next to the uh, app name that lets you see, oh, there's more text here. And if I touch that, you can actually click it, and it expands the notification. Um, this, this slide here, is there anything that we can do to avoid like racing through? I mean, I race through stuff anyway, but I mean, this is ridiculous. Uh, all right. We're going to hold it right there. We'll see, we'll see what happens. I move the mouse around. Um, I'll turn around three times and spit if that doesn't work. Um, I, this is a slide that you're not supposed to be able to follow. It's like a London tube map, uh, which I certainly can't follow. I just want to mo motivate that all of the old information is still here in the templates. It's just moved down around to a new place. So if you're already using the Notification Builder APIs, we'll take care of all that for you. We'll move it into new spots. <clears throat> Um, another thing that's useful to know, particularly uh, as an end user, is sort of where you can actually touch on things. Um, so here are the hit targets. I just wanted to make a note that even though that expand indicator is really small, the hit target for it is really big. You touch anywhere on that top row, you expand the whole notification. So if you, as a developer, have been using expanded notifications and you're worried that like no user knows how to find it, this is how. There's a button you can touch. Finally, after three years, so a button you can touch. A button you can the slide. Seriously, I don't know what. Uh, it, this thing, this thing really likes me to do. So what do you have to do? If you're using the builder, like I said, you don't have to you do anything. Everything is uh, already going to be moved to the new templates for you. If you're doing custom remote, you, remote views, you have a lot of work to do, as you have every single other release, because remote views, you have to re-sculpt everything from scratch to make sure that it uh, matches the new template design. But help is finally on the way. For the very first time, we have a new template that is just designed to say, hey, I've got some custom content to put in the middle of this view. But please, system, decorate the rest of it exactly the way it's supposed to be done. So we call it decorated, media, or decorated custom view style. And uh, what you can see here is essentially a schematic of the orange section. You just do whatever you want inside of remote views, just like you did before with custom remote views. But the system will then put in the expand indicator, the app uh, uh, accountability, the app name at the top, and even put in the actions for you at the bottom. So if you've got a custom weather widget uh, or something like that, but you want to have it match the system style, you're good to go. Uh, another new, big new thing that is new in N, we didn't talk about it much at the keynote yesterday, but if you've been playing along at home with the uh, N developer preview, uh, you've seen this, is that we are now finally, finally, finally supporting groups uh, on the phone. You want me to use this one? All right. Thanks a lot, man. We have an amazing crew here today. Thank you very much. Um, 
We actually added notification groups all the way back in API 20 for Android Wear. And of course, you've got this awesome screenshot from like centuries ago showing the original Wear point at 1.0 uh, view of how notification groups look as a stack of cards. And on the phone, yeah, you just see a summary, right? You just see one thing. Usually you do inbox style to mask over what would have otherwise been a group of really nice notifications. Um, now you can do this on the phone as well and on tablets. It, the exact same APIs move forward. So if previously your app was you know, doing some sort of you know, looking around to see if the Wear companion was installed, don't do that anymore. Just post all of your notifications in that group, which you associate by group key, and they'll show up this way. Um, each one of those notifications is its own full notification. So it can be expanded. It can have its own actions and everything. It's really, really outstanding. Um, if you haven't used this API before, it's really easy to do. Uh, you say set group when you're building a notification with Builder. Um, the string that you pass basically becomes a, uh, a co-location key that we use to collect groups together by name. You still want to use a summary notification for two reasons. One, this is what we'll show on phones pre-N, right? Because we don't know how to do groups pre-N, so we just show the summary. Um, but in N, we'll take that summary and we'll extract little bits and pieces of it to make, you see that little, that little header row right at the top above the bundle? Um, we actually pull that information from the summary. So if, for example, you're displaying a group that represents one inbox, right, or one account in your, in your chat app, that might be the place that, because of the summary, we know, OK, that's the account name, and that's what we'll put in that summary row. But then the, each individual conversation or each individual email thread then goes into its own notification in the group. And finally, if you want to make sure that those things appear in the correct order, use set sort key. We'll just sort them, again, on that string lexicographically to make sure the notifications show up exactly the way you want them to see. Um, the other big uh, end user feature, oh, now it's not going. All right, there we go. The other big end user feature for notifications in N that you developers need to know about is direct reply. Um, and we had this on where as well, uh, where you could essentially post a notification that somebody could then talk to the watch, and then that text would immediately be sent back to the app, and you could send an SMS with it. Now we have it on the phone. And in fact, you just type directly into the notification shade itself. It's really awesome, particularly from the lock screen. So I've got a nice little build here. You can see you get a message, you touch reply, and you're just typing right in there, even if it's on the lock screen. It's fantastic. Um, if you've never used this API before, because again, it's, it was introduced with API 20 for where. If you've never used it before, you want to build something called remote input. Remote input is something you hang off of an action that says, by the way, if you know how to send me text back, Please do it in this way. And so you set up a specific key so that when you get your intent back from that action click, you can extract out uh, the text that was entered. Um, something I want to point your attention to, if you've already been using remote input, you probably have uh, an activity there as the pending intent on the, on the input. Um, in N, it really, really needs to be, uh, for that action, it needs to be a service or a broadcast receiver. And here's why. If you have an action with an activity intent on the lock screen, the lock screen is going to say, oh, the user wants to go somewhere when I click this thing, and it's going to pop up that authentication challenge. It's going to pop up the pin pad or the pattern uh, or fingerprint or what have you. Um, but what you want to do for a remote input that where you want the user to be able to just type straight away on the lock screen is make sure it goes to a background thing like a, a broadcast receiver or a service uh, so that there's no authentication required. Um, now, if you're panicking and saying, whoa, 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 hang on, I don't want my users to be, you know, allow people to send SMSs on their behalf from the lock screen, that is an end user setting. So if you go into settings as a user, you can say, do I want to be able to type into things on my lock screen or not? So that's covered by system settings. You don't have to worry about it. All you have to do is make sure that that remote input is available for users who do want to opt into that feature to just type, type away from the lock screen or anywhere else. Um, one last thing I just do want to point out, when you uh, set up that room, wow. You know what, I'm glad this is happening here in this room as opposed to like yesterday during the keynote. I'm, I'm, I'm cool with that. Um, so when you've got your broadcast receiver, you just want to make sure you use this method, remote input, get results from intent. That's the way that you extract that text back out. And all of this sample code is just stolen mercilessly from our developer docs. So um, particularly if you download uh, DP3, the developer preview for Android, um, all of this stuff is going to be in there. You don't have to copy it down. You can sketch note it if you want. Um, you'll be able to pull this directly into your app and get remote input running. Another thing that I wanted to mention is after you get a reply. So, so here's the flow. You post the notification. The user touches reply, types directly in it. You get the intent back, extract the text. Great. This is what the user wanted to send as a comment or an SMS or whatever. What do you do now? So previously, when people do direct reply, there, our pattern was that you would just dismiss the notification. You assume the user is done with it. Not anymore. We assume now that in N, a user is going to decide to dismiss that notification whenever they want, 
This way they can post you know, one or two quick messages in rapid succession without losing that context. Um, so after you get a remote input direct reply, leave the notification up. And more than that, you actually want to re-notify to signify, oh yeah, we got it. We got this. It's been posted. And we have this API called set remote input history that basically all it does is draws a little line underneath your existing notification content, whatever it was, and then puts in any reply text that you want. So you can make a UI like this where you say, oh, you've left that comment. And the user knows, OK, this transaction has been completed. I don't have to wonder whether it's been posted. I'm set. So this works really well for something like leaving a comment on a picture or something like that, where um, you have the original notification content, and then you've got replies that sit after it. But that doesn't really work all that well for a chat, because chats are back and forth, right? You say something, they say something. You say something, they say something. Set remote input history doesn't quite cover that case. We've got something even better for you, but I'm going to hold that off. I'm going to let Alex talk about that, because that's real fun. In fact, why don't you go ahead and get started? The, the clicker is fidgety. Maybe it likes you better than me. Let's it, might, it. it might, or maybe it'll advance seven times for each time I click. That's right. Yeah. Great. All right. So uh, Dan's told you a little bit about how N brings some pretty big changes to the visual style of notifications on the phone. Well, I think that I'm going to one-up him and say that Android Wear 2.0 uh, is the biggest notification redesign in the history of Android Wear which also happens to be the only notification redesign in the history of Android Wear, but I'm going to one-up Dan anyway, so uh, you know, I'll take it. Um, before I start, I do want to mention briefly that uh, while this section applies to all notifications on Wear, it's mostly geared towards bridge notifications coming from a phone app. If you want to learn some other ways to approach this for notifications coming from a local Wear app, uh, you can go to the Making uh, Wear Apps More Standalone talk at 2 PM or view our dev docs. It doesn't like me. There you go. Uh, so the very first impression that a user gets of your app's notification is the card itself in the context stream. Let's talk a little bit of history. Uh, in Android Wear 1X, cards were cool. You could specify different card heights, add big background images for visual context. You could toss in or hide a small icon or a content icon and get all sorts of different fonts and treatments. All these features provided a lot of visual richness and impact to the cards themselves. That said, the richness could sometimes backfire. Um, like when the background image itself was mostly obscured by the uh, card itself or diverse font treatments made it hard for a user to actually determine what was most important for a notification at a glance. We thought about this, about what the purpose of a notification card is, about the importance of high glanceability, and changed things around a little bit in Wear 2.0. Notification cards now look a little different. Visually, all the same components are there, like then I promise, they're all there, but we've made them a little more consistent and more information first. We've switched from our card-based design to a dark, bold material theme. We now use color to start telling the story. The color that, you app, that your app sets in the notification now applies to the entire notification surface, immersing the user in your content. Explicit typography and intentional treatment help give the user focus for the most important information first. The color treatment also serves to bring a bit of uh, visual consistency and coherence to the notification. Because you set the color from your app, notifications coming from you look like they're coming from you, and notifications coming from another app look like they're coming from another app. The other part of this material update is a uh, set of changes to the layout of the uh, card itself. Remember, though, like I said before, all the same content is there. You can look at this right over there. And uh, trust me, got it listed out and broken out for you. It's just switched around a little bit. First off, we take a one-size-fits-all approach to the actual notification. All notifications are the same size, one screen. No more different card heights. Second, we've taken the large icon in the background, that nice, rich icon there, and we've brought it to the front, of, front and center of the notification. It's no longer partially obscured by the card or anything like that. We've also brought, yes, we've also brought the uh, small icon uh, from the card itself to, um, well, it's still actually on the notification, but we've brought it down to the uh, bottom right of that uh, large icon. Finally, uh, the content text and title are centered. We've made the font treatment a little more consistent with an emphasis on glanceability. Uh, now that you know what your notification looks like, I'm going to put it in the context of the actual system. A little bit more history. Uh, in Android Wear 1X, the context stream could be a bit confusing to navigate. The stream was ostensibly a single n-length vertical list of your notifications. However, each of those N notifications could also have an M length vertical list of cards, creating a sort of M by N, like big scrollable space. You can just sort of watch the interaction on the screen and kind of realize. 
Uh, you could page down the stream one, two, three, a couple more times, and then page to the right a couple times. Uh, at that point, remembering how to get back to where you were, going from, say, row five, column four, to row two, column one, became a mental exercise in memory and pathfinding, which is not exactly ideal when you are trying to rapidly triage your notifications on your tiny little wrist computer. On the other hand, the context stream in Android Wear 2.0 is pretty simple to navigate. Like in 1X, the stream is ostensibly a single n length list of, of notifications. Unlike in 1X, that's it. Simple, easy, no pathfinding. Also, uh, just a quick note, we fixed one of the things that bugged me the most about the old stream, where you could sort of like flick from card to card to card, but if you had, say, seven or eight or nine or 10 notifications, you actually could only go one at once, paginating through them. Uh, now we've made it possible to vertically fling through those notifications from top to bottom, bottom to top, et cetera. Again, sort of a big old point there uh, for uh, rapid usability. Now, if you've been thinking about the implications of what I've been saying here, you've realized that a one-size-fits-all approach might not actually fit all of your content. In fact, because smartwatches are very small, it probably will not fit all of your content, and some of it will be clipped. To solve this problem, Android Wear 2.0 introduces expanded notifications. Now, in the new stream, the entire notification is a tap target. Tapping that notification launches the expanded notification experience. This is automatically rendered with Wear 2.0's new material guidelines, which allows you to provide a lightweight, app-like experience to your users with minimal effort. All of the notification content is arranged vertically in a single surface, with the content first, followed by the primary action at the end. All the other actions that you add to your notification are put in the wearable action drawer component, which is a new component you can learn more about by going to the Android Wear 2.0 material design session at 3 p.m. Now, what do you need to do to enhance your notifications with this new rich experience? Nothing. You get it all for free. This example here is uh, one of the simpler notifications that you can build. It has a text, title, icons, an action, Three of those things are actually necessary to even build a notification in the first place. And you do this, and all of that nice material richness just comes along for the ride. That said, if you want your notifications to really pop, to be information rich and visually impactful, you may need to take full advantage of the notification styles and templates. As you can see here, expanded notifications can be both information dense and visually engaging. You can use templates like big text or big picture, and you can add extra pages to get even more information into the notification itself. I'm gonna dive into each of these in a second, but you can see here the level of richness and visual diversity that you can get in an expanded notification. The first example there was a big text notification, which you can see here with the text content rendered in the stream and on the expanded notification surface. However, that notification also has an action with the remote input that Dan was talking about that we have had for a couple years, and choices, which are rendered directly on the expanded notification itself, which allows users to take action directly or even respond without having to talk or type from the notification surface. The next example was a notification with two big picture cards added to it, whose images get put straight on the expanded notification surface, which creates a sort of immersive photo viewing experience just from a notification. Now, I'm about to show you some code for all of this, so just look closely to remember what we're actually going to be building. This is most of the code. Now, those two images are extra pages in the notification, and extra pages are actually notifications in their own right. So we're going to create a notification first. Then we're gonna set that notification style to a big picture style, and then attach your image to the style with a simple chain method call on it. To make the second big picture, Copy-paste works just as well in code as it does in slides, so just do that. And then to actually add those pages, we're gonna to need to create a wearable extender and add those two notifications as pages to it. Finally, we're gonna build the notification itself by creating a builder, setting the title, text, and icons, and finally extending the notification with the wearable extender that we built earlier. The rest is as simple as calling Notification Manager Notify, and you'll end up with an expanded notification just like that with this rich photo viewing experience. Now, I do also wanna mention that extra pages can be heterogeneous, and you can mix, mix and match them to get exactly what you want. This lets you make rich notifications like this one for a user's ticket to see Space Fights 7. Notification has three extra pages containing a QR ticket, movie details, and a plot synopsis. As you can see here, 
All of those pages are stacked vertically in the order that you add them, which essentially allows you to use extra pages as kind of building blocks to construct the expanded notification exactly as you want. This makes it easy to create an engaging and useful Wear experience without actually having to make an app. Finally, I'm going to talk about one of the keynotes of Wear 2.0's um, communications improvements, messaging style. Messaging style is an entirely new notification style introduced with Android Wear 2.0, which gives users a full back and forth chat experience right in a notification. When a user taps into the expanded notification itself, they're going to have access to the full context of their conversation, letting them get, say, right back to the work chat from the day before, or the conversation with their friends about how Space Fight 7 was really awesome, way better than the prequels, and maybe even lived up to the originals. You also notice that the chat history includes sender names there, meaning that group conversations work well too. That said, messaging style is not just about formatting. You could theoretically do all of this yourself with a big text, and actually most of you who have messaging apps already are, and just adding it as an extra page uh, with wearable extender. The real key to messaging style is actually how messaging style and remote input work in concert to give the user this experience. Unlike the use, uh, other uses of remote input, reply, the user replying won't actually drop them out of the expanded notification. Instead, their response is going to show up immediately in line on the notification surface itself. This means that users are going to see their messages instantly in front of them before a round trip to the phone and your app has completed. This makes the user experience very responsive and fast and feels just very good all up. If your app reposts the notification with new content, it will also update in place, meaning that responses and replies by other users also show up in this surface without the user having to say, go, back, uh, go out and back in or retap a notification or anything. It's all right there, giving that full back and forth chat experience in the notification. Now, you're all savvy developers and have probably noticed that these remote input choices have been really good, way better than they should be. That, uh, you also may actually have mentally linked that to uh, David's talk in the keynote if you're especially savvy. Uh, but the summary is that in the future, we are going to be bringing smart the smart reply feature from Inbox and Allo to messaging style notifications on where, meaning that you, as a developer can optionally give your users dynamically generated quality contextual responses to pick from all for free. Good, yeah, it's, it's very cool. Like, let's be clear. <laughs> but, uh, now I'm going to talk about a little bit of code. Um, to actually use messaging style and to get it to work end to end, you're going to need to create a reply action with a remote input. While technically not necessary, as I mentioned before, the real goodness of messaging style comes from how messaging style and remote input work together. Just one on their own is, only gives you sort of half of the experience. Now, this slide is actually completely shamelessly copied from Dan's slide, which is in turn shamelessly copied from our developer documentation, including the Android version callout. So uh, all I'm going to say now is that you need to do this and move on. Creating the messaging style itself is actually very simple. You simply need to create a new instance of messaging style with the reply name that's going to show up when the user replies in place, and then add all of the previous messages from the conversation to the style by calling add message with the text, time, and sender. Finally, you just need to build the notification itself. Build it as normal, set the style to messaging style, and add the action that I completely glossed over and call notify. That's really actually all there is to it. If you notice and we're paying attention, that's a little bit easier even than just adding two pictures to a notification in the first place. <laughs> now, with that code that we've just gone through on your phone app, you are able to give user, your users a full back and forth chat experience on Android Wear. That's it, nothing else. Now, to go back to about 10-ish minutes ago, uh, when Dan mentioned that there was a better way of doing chat notifications on the phone than using set remote input history, I have some good news. We learned from the path that remote input and notification groups took, and this time we're going to be bringing a where feature to the phone immediately instead of waiting a year or two for it to show up. Messaging style on the phone works just like on where using remote input for direct replies, as you can see here. Additionally, if the user does still want that full great app experience that you've built, and I'm sure they will, they just have to tap the notification to deep link into your app, just like before. Now, uh, a quick note here is that 
We've put a lot of effort into making messaging style work on Android 2.0 devices, no matter what version of Android they are paired to. This means that users running phones with an OS as early as Jelly Bean still get messaging style goodness on Android Wear. All you have to do is these three things in your phone app. First, you have to use notification compat.builder as opposed to notification builder. Second, you have to use notification compat messaging style instead of notification messaging style. To be fair, these are both things that you're probably already doing because compatibility is pretty important here. Um, and then third, and you're probably already doing this if you're a messaging app, which I mentioned before, uh, you need to add the user's chat history as an extra page with wearable extender to continue to support Android Wear 1X. If you've done these things, you're going to end up with the following as shown by these handy tiny little charts. First, on Android Wear 2.0, regardless of what version the phone is running, you're going to get messaging style, everything that I showed you, full chat experience right in the notification. On Wear 1X, paired to any phone, you're going to get the standard notification card in the stream. And because you added that extra page, it's going to show up and your users are still going to get their chat history. Because messaging style is a bespoke experience on Android Wear 2.0, we don't actually show those extra pages. Finally, on the phone, if your user's running N, they're going to get messaging style notification. And if they're not, notification compat ensures that they still get the standard notification experience. All these things sort of summed up together mean that if you use messaging style and these two other things that I said, you get the best of all worlds no matter what device is paired, no matter what version those devices are running. So what actual steps do you, a developer, need to take to work uh, with the changes that we've made in Android Wear 2.0? First, you need to make sure that the notification in the stream itself is rapidly glanceable, which basically means focus on the text. Second, to get all this expanded notification goodness and really take full advantage of it, use extra content pages with wearable extender to really like, use, structure those building blocks and build the experience out for your users. Third, and this is also pretty important, is that notifications, as you noticed, are dark now. That means that color spanables um, and display intents for your notifications are actually maybe not going to work as well as you would like because you need to support dark backgrounds on 2.0 and light backgrounds on 1X. Kind of hard to find colors that work on both. That said, quick call out here. If you have a standalone app or a Wear app at all, all you have to do to make this work is just check the API level uh, at runtime or use a resource qualifier to adjust your colors as necessary. You can still use them as normal. Finally, last bit, if you're a messaging app, make sure that you use notification compat and messaging style to give your users an awesome Wear experience without having to write the Wear app. If any of this stuff interests you, and it probably should, uh, just go to g.co slash Wear Preview, and you can get the preview SDK, device images, and more information about the new APIs that we're going to be launching. All right, fantastic. Thank you, Alex. Is everybody like, still awake? Do we need to stand up, like, shake a leg? Drink more coffee. Anything, yeah. Um, we've got a few more things that I want to cover here. Let's switch places so I can uh, poke the computer. Uh, a few more things we want to talk about. Um, and then if we have time, I'd love to open it up for, uh, for questions. Let's get through it. Uh, first, I want to draw your attention. OK, let's make sure the keyboard works. Um, so this guy here, um, he had a lot less hair, uh, answered the question at Google I.O. 2012 when we first introduced uh, rich notifications with Jelly Bean and at the same time introduced uh, the ability for users to block notifications that they found inappropriate or, or uh, spammy or what have you. Uh, and somebody got up at the mic and said, excuse me, as an app, can I find out when the user has blocked my notifications? And this guy got up there and said, no. <laughs> so uh, actually, this is pretty easy to do. Um, uh, the initial implementation, actually, you couldn't do it. But when AppOps came along, which you may know is the foundation of our you know, permission system, uh, we moved notification blocking over to AppOps because, hey, you know, it, it, it's a new system facility for exactly this sort of thing. Um, and it turns out that because of some performance uh, optimizations in AppOps, you can, from any app uh, at runtime, do some you know, funky introspection and uh, just check to see whether an operation is allowed before even invoking it. It makes it much faster to do certain kinds of operations. So yeah, you can find out whether your notifications have been blocked by reflecting in Java. So um, at the time, we were really worried that if apps knew when their notifications were being blocked, the world would end. It's 2016. 
Four years later, the world has not ended. So we said, fine, you know what? Let's just make a real API for this because we think there are actually some legitimate uses of it. So I'll get to that in a second. Um, you can say notification manager dot are notifications enabled. Real easy. Like, are they? <laughs> has the user blocked my notifications or not? And you don't have to do those ugly hacks, and you don't have to go uh, online uh, and and <laughs> look that stuff up. Um, and the reason that we introduced this, in addition to wanting to reduce the number of places that people had to resort to those hacks, is that you can actually create a better experience. Here's the situation. A user feels like they're not getting notifications from your app, and they don't understand why. So they go into the app, they go into settings, they see all the boxes are ticked, notifications are turned on, I don't know what's wrong, one star. So now what you can do in your app, in your settings, this is sort of a mock-up that I, I use Gmail as a, as a guinea pig here, but obviously you could do this in your own app. If a user goes in to modify notification settings, your app could go and say, oh, hang on a second. Are they, oh, you, you block notifications at the system level. Like There's nothing we can do until you go and unblock that. So you can alert users to those conflicts, and I think that's a great user experience. If you do use this, in some sort of abusive way. If you use this API to create some kind of arms race with the user, oh, you, you blocked my notifications, well, I'm going to use a top level system alert window or whatever, I will come and find you, so don't do it. Um, let's see, other stuff you want to know about. Uh, if you use Builder, and if you're not using Builder, we have to have another dot conversation because set latest event info doesn't work anymore. Um, if you're using Builder, uh, we've changed a little bit how the memory works. It used to, uh, whenever you call build, it would construct a new notification object uh, that was a snapshot of its state and hand that off to you. Now it actually retains that object internally and just gives you a pointer. The big reason for this is that notifications are huge. They didn't used to be, but now people adding wearable extenders and car extenders and lots of big bitmaps and things like that. Um, they're big objects, and we didn't want you to have to suffer that in your memory partition every time you constructed up a new notification. So when you're using a builder, it is holding on to that prototypical sort of embryonic notification. And when you call build, you just get a pointer to it. If you're not expecting that kind of behavior, the way things work in N is going to be possibly a little confusing. But this actually will make memory better for you. It makes memory better uh, on the system uh, overall. This is also important when you are posting updates to notifications. We see a lot of people in the field caching their notification object and then using either poking directly into the slots on that POJO or um, using remote views methods to try to update like progress bars and things like that in the notification. You can't do that anymore. Uh, I mean, you can. It's not really going to work because, well, I'll get to the, what happened to those remote views in a second. What you want to do if you are posting updates to your notification and you want to keep some memory around as long as your app is still alive is hold on to the builder. The builder will hold on to the notification. It'll be nice and fast to just go and talk to the builder and make your changes there and call build again. Um, this is a good bully pulpit for me to remind you about features we've introduced over the last couple of years that you may not be using yet. Uh, since L notifications have been available on the lock screen on all L Android devices, um, but users have different tolerances for what kind of content is appropriate on the lock screen. The lock screen is kind of a public place. Uh, if they've got you know, PIN, password, uh, fingerprint security, potentially anybody can you know, pick your phone up off a cab seat and, and take a look at it. So uh, if a user has opted into what we call uh, you know, hide sensitive content notifications on the lock screen, your app is, your notification is just really not going to say anything interesting unless you specifically say, oh, here's a public version. Here's a version that's safe for the phone that's found in the backseat of the cab or even just you know, laying face up on your desk when somebody else is sitting in the same room. So go ahead and use set public version to supply a version of that notification that's OK for users who are security conscious. Or if it's something like a weather widget uh, or media playback when you want it to be available at all times, say, you know what? I'm just going to set the visibility of this notification to public, and then it's appropriate anywhere. And you don't have to make a separate version for it. Uh, something else I wanted to mention is the way that Do Not Disturb works. So uh, hopefully you've uh, had a chance to uh, play around with uh, the Do Not Disturb that we made really, really good in Marshmallow. Um, the way that it knows what things are phone calls or alarms uh, to allow the user to put the phone into alarms only mode and get those alarms or into priority mode and get phone calls from important people is with your metadata in the builder. And the two big ones are set category and add person. Set category allows you to say, this is an alarm. I know I'm not the, the, the built-in Android alarm clock app or the, the OEM's built-in alarm clock app, but this is you know, I've got this cool app called Timely, and it's got an alarm, and it should be treated as alarms when the user says, go into alarms only mode. You use set category to mark it that way. Uh, similarly, add person is the way that uh, users are allowed to opt certain 
human beings in to be able to break through uh, their priority settings. And so uh, you say add person, and we accept kind of anything that we could use to look that person up in the system contacts database. So you can throw, yeah, if you've got, fantastic, if you've got a content, uh, you know, uh, uh, content URI for that person in the contacts database, awesome. We'll just look it straight up. But you can also just supply an email address or a phone number. And we'll go ahead and look that up in Contacts DB, uh, particularly if your app doesn't really want to interact with the Android Contacts database, but it is phone number based. You can give us the phone number in the notification. We'll look it up. If the user has starred that contact, that notification can bust through priority mode, um, which is a great feature for users that want to tune out of most things, but there are some people uh, that should be able to get a hold of them at any time. Um, I just want to remind you that media style exists. Um, that was the new template that we introduced last time around. Uh, if you are building a music player or anything that kind of is like a music player, such as you know background control of some sort of like remote playback thing or video player, what have you, use media style, and we'll take care of all the details of making it look good on every platform version. Um, and uh, I mentioned earlier there was the uh, decorated custom view style. Um, if you feel like you really need to custom remote views, there's a decorated uh, media style style. I forget what it's called. Um, look at the API docs. I have to as well. Uh, to be able to get the system annotation of the app name and so forth and your actions uh, along with media. Um, the other thing that I want to mention specifically about media style is that if you uh, are using set, or if you were worried about using set color, which is the notification accent color feature, if you were worried about using that because it made your media playback notification look garish, it doesn't do that anymore. So in N, we are only using that color to tint some of the playback controls. So it should be a little bit safer to take your media player's brand colors, whether it's some livid green or orange or what have you, and set that as the color on your media style, and it should look really good uh, on N. Uh, this is uh, where we have a, a very, very brief moment of silence for APIs that are no longer with us. Um, specifically, all of the direct access to remote views on notification they're not going to work because we're not even creating them. Time was when you created a notification, even with the builder and called build, we would generate a whole remote views that looked exactly like that notification was going to appear uh, on the other side, and then we would stuff that thing into a parcelable and push it all through binder to the system server, push it all to the system you want. Yeah, we just don't do that anymore. The remote views is not there. If you have a custom remote views and you set it, those slots will be there. But if you use the builder methods, these uh, APIs, content view, big content view, heads up content view, um, are not there. So use builder.setContent. And actually, we renamed that method to set custom content view to make it better match the other stuff that's been developed in the meantime. All right, so this is for like two of you in the room who are using notification listener service. One of them is you, uh, because that's how Wear works. If you have a notification listener service, um, one of the things that we noticed after releasing this API 86 years ago is that uh, when we bind to them from system UI, we've been binding, or bind them from the notification manager, we've been binding for the lifetime of the system, because we sort of thought of them as an extension of the system UI, um, they are really expensive. So now if you have a listener that only needs to listen occasionally, like you know, it's, oh, we're only listening when you're in the car, or we're only listening when you're on a run, or we're only listening when you're using this particular app or experience, you can say, uh, request unbind. Like the user has approved me as a notification listener, but I don't need to be bound right now. I'll let you know when it's important to bind me again and start sending me notifications. So this can really improve uh, performance on the device. It can improve memory pressure. I think that's all the sundries. Um, there's lots and lots of resources online. Obviously, DP3 is out. You should go get that APK. Uh, go get that, that package. Um, we also have uh, sample code. We've updated them to show off groups and summaries, our standard uh, active notification sample on GitHub. Um, and then the messaging service update uh, demos remote input. I don't know if it demos messaging style yet. I think that that is still, like, still damp with how new it is. Uh, so yep. it's not in messaging service yet, but it will be. The wear docs do call that out. The wear docs mission, OK. So as developers, what do? Uh, test your existing notifications on end, definitely. Um, if you have lots of notifications that you're already posting and you're not grouping them, please, please group them. Nobody likes to turn on a phone in the morning and get 36 notifications of all the stuff that happened while you were asleep. Um, add direct reply where it's appropriate, where you can accept reply text. Um, and then if you're using custom notifications, do look at that decorated custom view style so users will get the benefit of the app attribution and the expand affordance. Um, and now, there's uh, where stuff. Back to where just a little bit. Uh, we're actually holding a lot of sessions today. Tons so of sessions. This is, this is a list if you want to come see more, starting with the big one, what's new in Android Wear 2.0, uh, and then a couple of the others that I actually mentioned during my portion of the talk. Also, as you know, if you've missed anything, all of these talks are going to be available on YouTube. Kind of shockingly quickly. Yeah. Uh, and finally, the Android Wear Sandbox. 
uh, you can go to, to for more questions and live demos. It is uh, the uh, green square on this map. It also is just sort of like through this wall and a little bit further, though, probably go around instead of actually through. So we have time maybe for like one or two live questions if you want to get up on the mic and ask. Otherwise, um, we're going to be outside. And there's also, we've enabled uh, the new Google Spaces app. Um, for this talk, many of the talks today have spaces associated with them where you can go and communicate with the people in this room and everybody else uh, to I uh, came to I.O. to talk about this topic, post your examples of your favorite notifications and least favorite notifications. But we've got a couple minutes. Let's go ahead and take some questions from the room. Yes, go ahead. On the wearer notifications, the new style, you said you can set the background color of those cards? Correct. Using the set color API, which is actually what Dan talked about um, with regards to media style specifically, calling set color for your notification will tint things on big Android and will also, on the littlest of Androids, uh, set the background color for all of those cards. Does it set it directly or just tint it? On uh, we use a darkened version of it. Great. Thanks. The list groups, is there a limit of how big that group could be? So there's a practical limit that no uh, package can post more than 50 notifications. Um, you shouldn't really be posting that many at all, but you can imagine a situation where you've got five accounts and you want to have 10 messages. That seems reasonable. Um, I don't remember if we actually ended up creating a limit, um, but you'll notice that you'll start to see system performance suffer if you're posting all 50 into that group at the same time, not least because it's not useful. The user's not going to want to triage that much stuff. Our recommendation is on the order of five, maybe as many as 10. Um, only your observation of user behavior will see will tell you what is actually going to be useful to people. Thanks. Uh, I have a music streaming app that supports Chromecast, and we actually had to drop the media style notification to um, match the requirements of the Chromecast uh, user best practices. Is there hmm. any plans to add like a Chromecast icon or like a disconnect button to that media style? Um, I, so I don't know what the underlap is between those two between those two APIs. So we should talk we should talk after and and maybe that sounds like the kind of thing that would be good. Um, there's a bug tracker specifically dedicated to the Android M previews. Um, that's a good place to raise that kind of issue because we are triaging those bugs pretty aggressively and and taking action on them. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, when does the app get to know notifications are disabled? Is there any listener or when it, only when it resumes? No, there's no there's no broadcast, so you can't find out um, like you know. What we really don't want you to do is to try to like min max the user's behavior and try to respond in real time to you know when uh, uh, the user becomes you know so enraged that they block notifications. It's expressly created so that you can do things like I showed in the screenshot. When the user has problems, you can say, well, here's one of the reasons that you might be having those problems. Okay. So there's no listener. But the app would detect when it is in the foreground. Yeah, I mean, you can check at any time. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Brando, Android do we are in the market? Uh, uh, all Android we are can upgradable to 2.0? If yes, when? It's a where 2.0 availability question. Uh, um, so where 2.0 is going to be available later this fall. Uh, the, to be fair, also, the developer preview is available right now on the uh, site that I linked, g.co slash where preview. OK, thank you very much. Thank you. All right, um, I think that's it. Uh, thank you so much. We'll see you on Spaces, and thank you for showing up. Thank you.